Chris Rice reveals that Matt DiBenedetto was likely going to be headed to Call of Racing in 2024. Shane Van Gisbergen will drive for Call of Racing in the NASCAR Cup Series. And Riley Hurts will run with Ricker Racing in the Daytona 500. What's going on, guys? It's Daniel, and welcome back to your video. we got some NASCAR and other motorsports stories discussed here today on the channel. Let's go ahead and just jump straight those really, really quickly. We're going to first take a look at a ton of paint schemes that have been revealed over the last couple days. The first paint scheme we're taking a look at is Denny Hamill's 2024 Mavis scheme that we'll see in eight races in 2024. Really glad to see that Mavis is working with Denny Hamill once again. There's nothing really changing with this paint scheme, but it's really awesome. It's cool to see that Mavis once again will be working with Denny Hamlin in Joe Gibbs' race in this season. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Bubba Wallace's 2024 Columbia scheme. I like the scheme a lot. I like the white, and this for me is my favorite Columbia scheme that I've seen from Bubba Wallace up to this point. Looking forward to see on the racetrack throughout 2024. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Kyle Busch's 2024 Cheddar scheme. This is different than last year's scheme, but personally, I really like it. It looks really good, and I'm excited to see it on the racetrack throughout the 2024 NASCAR Cup Series season. Looks really awesome, in my opinion. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Carson Oswald's 2024 Delaware Live scheme that we'll see in multiple races throughout 2024. I think this looks really good in my opinion, and glad to see that Carson Osmar has Delaware Life coming in to work with him throughout the 2024 season. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Sam Mayer's 2024 Carolina Carport scheme that we'll see in three races in 2024. First of all, really glad to see that Sam Mayer has a new sponsor for the season, and in general, glad to see that Carolina Carports will work with him throughout 2024. Next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Jimmy Johnson's 2024 Carvana scheme. This is a tribute scheme to Richard Petty's 1964 Daytona 500 win scheme. This looks incredible in my opinion, and one of my favorite paint schemes I've definitely seen so far in 2024. Excited to see it on the racetrack throughout the 2024 NASCAR Cup Series season. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Tyler Reddick's 2024 Jordan Brand scheme. This scheme is very similar to Kurt Busch's scheme he had in 2022 and looks very similar to the one that Kurt Busch had when he's able to win at Kansas in 2022. I like this a lot, and I'm excited to see that this paint scheme will be out in multiple races, including in this weekend's race at the Bush Light Clash. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Jack Wood's 2024 Crot scheme that we'll see in two races in 2024. Jack Wood obviously going to drive 16 races in the number 91 truck. I think it looks really solid. I like the scheme. It's a pretty good paint scheme, in my opinion. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Anthony Alfredo's 2024 Death Wish Coffee scheme that we'll see in the Daytona 500. I like the scheme. I like it a lot. I like the black. I like the number. I think the number placement is solid overall in this scheme, and I'm looking forward to seeing it on the racetrack throughout 2024. And the final paint scheme we're taking a look at is Brad Kozlowski and Chris Bush's 2024 Esperian schemes. Nothing's changing with these schemes, in my opinion. I don't really think there's anything going different with the schemes from last year. I think they're solid, though, and hopefully they can do a really good job with these paint schemes throughout the 2024 season. And now we're going to go ahead and move on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Choice. As it was announced on Wednesday morning that Choice will sponsor Daniel Suarez for four races in 2024. Choice, also known as Choice Hotels. Daniel Suarez already picked up a lot of sponsors for the 2024 season. Same with Track Guys. They've got Wendy's coming in to sponsor them this year. And you've also got a couple other brands working with Daniel Suarez, like Worldwide Express, which will sponsor Daniel Suarez in many races throughout 2024. I'm very excited to see, nonetheless, so that Choice will be joining to work with Trackhouse Racing throughout the 2024 season. And the scheme looks pretty good also, in my opinion. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about General Mills. As it was announced, I believe, yesterday or Wednesday that General Mills will activate its Cheerios and Totino's brands in NASCAR for 2024. And Cheerios will also sponsor Ricky Senhouse Jr. this weekend as well. General Mills has been involved in the sport for many years. We all know the iconic Cheerios scheme. I think that Clint Boyer ran for quite a bit in that number 33 car. I think it's really exciting to see that General Mills is getting more involved with the sport, and I'm excited to see that Cheerios will be working with JTG Doherty this season, and I'm excited to see if they'll see that paint scheme out on the racetrack and also some Totino schemes as well throughout 2024. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Clash Purse Money. Now, every time we have a Cup Xfinity Series and Truck Series race, 
Bob Pockers puts out the purse money for that event. And according to Bob Pockers, the purse for the clash is $2,210,000. I think that purse might be a little bit less than what it was last year in 2023. I think it was around $2.1 million last year. So the purse is up definitely a little bit compared to 2023. Nonetheless, I'm glad to see that there's a little more money coming into play. Obviously, the charter teams, which only the charter teams this time around, are going to be showing up for this event. I think it's exciting and glad to see that the purse money has went up just a little bit for this event. Really awesome and good stuff, in my opinion. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Crocs. As it was announced yesterday that Crocs has signed an official licensing deal with NASCAR. Now, Crocs has been involved in the sport for a very long time, but usually they're only involved with drivers. They have been involved with drivers since around the 2006 season, according to Adam Stern. And I think having Crocs, Crocs basically having a licensing deal with NASCAR, I think is absolutely huge. I think they could really help grow the sport in a massive, in a huge way. And I think that having Crocs and some branding, there'll probably be some NASCAR style shoes with Crocs this year. I think this is a very good move for them to do this. I'm really excited about this. And nonetheless, glad to see that Crocs will be joining the sport in a pretty massive and big way. I'm very excited for them. And I'm glad to see that they'll be working with them throughout the 2024 season. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about David Ingram Jr. As it was announced on Wednesday evening that David Ingram Jr. will once again be the crew chief for Lift Fast Motorsports in 2024 in the number 78 car. David Ingram Jr., I believe, has been the crew chief for the number 78 car for the last couple of seasons, and crew chief for BJ McLeod and other drivers who've driven the number 78 car. Now, we know that this number 78 team, the, the organization, will be around for a select number of races, including the Daytona 500, but we're not entirely sure how many races exactly they are going to be showing up throughout the 2024 NASCAR Cup Series season. But having David Ingram, who has experience with this organization and team, come back and work with them, I think is a really solid move to bring him back into the team and the organization. And nonetheless, I'm very happy to see that David Ingram is getting the opportunity and a chance once again to have a chance to work with this team in 2024. It's a big move for them and glad to see that we'll have David Ingram working with Live Fast Motorsports in the 2024 NASCAR Cup Series season. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about NASCAR full speed. Now, yesterday or Wednesday, Adam Stern put out a tweet indicating what the number position for NASCAR full speed was, which, of course, for those who don't know, was the documentary that came out on Netflix. And according to Adam Stern, NASCAR full speed on Netflix debuted on Netflix's top 10 most watched list in many different countries. It debuted at number three in Canada. It debuted at number five in the U.S., it debuted at number six at Ireland, and Portugal number seven in the UK was number nine. I believe also Latvia was around at number six and seven, and also South Africa was number 10 as well. NASCAR Full Speed, I've been able to watch the documentary, and I understand why it's up there in a very high position on the debuts. Because I think the documentary was probably the most serious the sport has been when it comes to documentaries and other things in a very, very long time. It showcased nine really good drivers who, of course, are competing in the postseason and the playoffs, including Bubba Wallace, Kyle Larson, and Tyler Reddick, and also William Byron and Ryan Blaney. And I think Denny Hamill's absolutely the star of the show when it came to NASCAR full speed, especially in the first half of the show. And seeing the numbers that have come out about this show is really phenomenal and absolutely incredible. And nonetheless, I'm glad to see that NASCAR full speed ended up being in the top 10 list in many different companies and countries and not just in the United States. Being number five in the U.S., by the way, for debuts in the first week is really phenomenal and incredible. So glad to see the NASCAR full speed is sticking around. I really hope they do make a second season because I really enjoyed it. And I'm glad to see that I was able to get some pretty good numbers for 2024. Really awesome and great stuff overall, in my honest opinion. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Corey LaJoy and Shane Van Gisbergen. As it was announced on Wednesday that Corey LaJoy and Shane Van Gisbergen have been joined Kevin Harvick Incorporated Management. They will join the likes of William Sawalich, Kevin Harvick, obviously, Ryan Priest, Harrison Burton, uh, I believe maybe Carson Hosovar may be on there. There's a couple other big names that are part of Kevin Harvick Incorporated Management. But it's really huge we're bringing in Corey LaJoy and Shane Van Gisbergen. We're going to talk about 
that SVG here later at the end of this episode, making his select Cup Series starts, and eventually wants to go full-time Cup Series racing, potentially in 2025. And then you got Corey LaJoy with Spire Motorsports, working with that team this season as well. And having KHI management, one of the big things that will come with working with KHI management is they're going to be able to bring sponsorship and funding over to both of those drivers, probably from Kevin Harvick Incorporated Management. That group, I think, picking up both these drivers, I think is phenomenal and really awesome to see. So very happy nonetheless to see that we got both those guys working with them in 2024. Very awesome and great stuff to see overall, and very nonetheless happy to see that Corey Joy and Shane Van Gisbergen have joined KHI Management. Really awesome stuff to see. And now we're going ahead and on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Starcom Racing. As Starcom Racing confirmed yesterday afternoon that they are joining the Michelin Pilot Challenge on a part-time basis in 2024. This is going to be the first time that Starcom Racing has been involved in motorsports since around the 2021 season when they were in the NASCAR Cup Series. But they left the sport at the end of 2021, basically became the money team quintessentially. A lot of people working with the money team, money team came from Starcom Racing. And obviously Starcom sold their charter for $13.3 million to 2311 Racing so they could expand their two-car operation. That due to cars being for bubble walls in the 23 and also the 45 car, which would have eventually be driven by Kurt Busch in 2022. Now, obviously, Starcom Racing being back in motorsports is phenomenal to see. I don't remember if they announced a driver or not that is going to be behind the wheel of the Starcom machine. I don't remember what manufacturer they're going to be running and because I know that they're not planning to come back to NASCAR anytime soon. I wonder if they'll work maybe with Mercedes, perhaps. I'm not sure at this point, but I think it is really awesome to see the Starcom Racing, even if they weren't the greatest team in NASCAR. I think it's really cool to see that a former team in NASCAR is getting the chance and opportunity to go to the Michelin Pilot Challenge and race in that respective series. I think it's a great move for them, and I think bringing them back is really good to see. So I'm very happy to see the Starcom Racing is coming back to motorsports and working in IMSA, which IMSA is owned by NASCAR. And it shows that the Michelin Pilot Challenge as well is growing in a major way. So very happy and glad to see, though, that Michelin Pilot Challenge is growing. And I'm very happy to see that Starcom Racing is making a return to motorsports. It's a great move overall for every party involved. In my honest opinion, to see a team like Starcom Racing be able to make a comeback and return. And now we're going ahead to move on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Patrick Emmerling. As it was announced yesterday that Patrick Emmerling will be driving the number 07 for SS Greenlight Racing for majority races in 2024. This also confirms he'll be running, I think, around 24 to 25 races. Every single race that doesn't affiliate with his Wheel and Modified Tour schedule, because remember, Patrick Emmerling is going to be competing full-time in the Wheel and Modified Tour in 2024. Every time that there's an event there, someone else will take his place in the Xfinity Series. But this is a very solid opportunity for Patrick Emmerling. Now, what does this mean for Emmerling Gase Racing? Well, it was actually confirmed yesterday from Patrick Emmerling himself that Emmerling Gase will no longer be a partnership in 2024. Now, Joey Gase, to my understanding, is still expected to field a NASCAR Xfinity Series team in 2024 for a select number of races this year or the full season. I wonder, though, if it'll be a paid driver getting behind the wheel of that seat or Joey himself a race, because Joey Gase did run quite a few races in 2023. I wonder if he'll be back behind the wheel of a seat this year and for the whole entire year in 2024. But this is a very good opportunity for Patrick Emily. Now, I would love to see J.J. Yelly get the chance and opportunity. I would have definitely love to see someone like a Frankie Muniz get a chance and opportunity for SS Greenlight Racing. But Patrick Emerling is not a bad driver. He's been solid in the Wheel of Modified Tour for many, many years. And in general, I think that he'll bring a lot to the table for Emerling Gase Motorsports, not Emerling Gase, uh, SS Greenlight this season. I'm excited to see what he can do. I think he's going to do a really good job with this organization. And hopefully he can make the best of it throughout the 2024 season with SS Greenlight. I'm excited to see him get the chance and opportunity to work with SS Greenlight Racing in the 2024 NASCAR Xfinity Series season. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Dry Ryan Bull Racing as they have revealed their 2024 Indianapolis 500 lineup. 
Ryan Hunter Ray is going to drive the number 23 car for Dry Ryan Bull Racing. And Connor Daly is going to drive the number 24 car. Now, Don Cusick is still going to be involved with this organization in 2024. And Don Cusick will be working with Connor Daly this season in 2024. This is a really strong lineup for Dry Ryan Bull Racing going into this year. You've got a former Indy 500 winner, Ryan Hunter Ray, who won the 2014 edition of the race. And you have Connor Daly, who generally shines and I think led the most laps in the 2021 edition of this event. So I expect Joe Drivers to be very, very competitive. Now, they do have to qualify in, but we know that Dry Ryan Bull Racing is a really strong organization. They tend to only run one or two races every single year, and usually they run the Indy 500 and they put their eggs in the Indy 500 basket, but they usually do an overall amazing and good job when it comes to that. So I expect both of them to be very, very competitive. I think both are easily going to make the race this year in 2024. And I think it's just an exciting move overall to see that Dry Rainbow Racing will have the, both these guys throughout the 2024 season. I'm excited for them, I'm, and I'm glad to see nonetheless that both drivers will be running the Indy 500 with Dry Rainbow Racing in the 2024 season. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Justin Haley. Now, there was a Motorsports.com article that came out, I believe it was on Wednesday, indicating that Justin Haley told the media that he says he has turned down one or two Indy 500 rides, at least one or two rides in his career up to this point. This is very, very interesting. Now, it's kind of weird to me that Justin Haley is saying this, considering I think Justin Haley, yes, I believe he is a very good driver. But personally, I don't think Justin Haley is 100% or 1,000% telling the truth here. I think he might be telling the truth to an extent, saying one ride, but is it one or is it two? Are you? Did you only get one offer or did you only get two offers? I want to know what teams exactly they were and at least admit and come clean and admit and say what two teams gave you the opportunity and chance. Because otherwise, a lot of people, and I saw a lot of people commenting on the Motorsports.com Twitter page when that post came out. I wonder exactly which teams had given him offers. Maybe Dry Ryan Bowl Racing, perhaps. Maybe now there could be an opportunity for him to do, though, considering the fact he's with Rick or Racing all year. I wonder if, because Rick, I think, is still kind of evolved with the old coin racing. I wonder if there's a chance that Justin Haley could get to do the Indy 500 in the future. Maybe like Kyle Larson, who, of course, is going to do a double this year. I wonder if we are going to see Justin Haley in the future get an opportunity with Rick or Racing in Dale Coyne. That would be very interesting to watch. And I think Justin Haley is a talented driver and one of the more underrated drivers in the field. And he has had some open wheel experience, basically racing in dirt. But open wheel dirt is different than open wheel in IndyCar. And it's a lot different. But a lot of NASCAR drivers, when they go to IndyCar, they tend to be very successful. So I wonder if he'll get an opportunity chance in the not-so-distance future to maybe work with them in 2025 or 26 in an Indy 500 ride. I think that would be awesome and pretty exciting if that was to happen. So hopefully he gets a chance in the future, as I think he's talented enough to do it. I don't know if he's telling the truth about getting the opportunity, but nonetheless, it would be pretty awesome and cool to see him get a chance and opportunity to run the Indianapolis 500 in the not-so-distance future. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Tony Bridinger. As it was announced yesterday that Tony Bridinger will drive the one for Tricon Garage at Daytona International Speedway in a couple weeks. She also will be sponsored by Celsius in most of her ARCA races this year, and she has become a Celsius athlete. This is a really good opportunity for Tony Bridinger. She did make a couple select starts last season with Tricon Garage, and honestly, while she didn't do absolutely amazing by any stretch of imagination, she did not do an awful job with Tricon Garage last year. And I think that with her super speedway experience, I think she does have a chance and opportunity to be at least a little bit competitive. But realistically here, I think there could be some issues that come along the way. Obviously, there was a lot of talk during this offseason. Maybe she could go full-time the Tricon Garage. But I also wonder how many starts exactly she is going to make with this team. I wonder if this is the only opportunity with Tricon or if we'll see her run a couple other select races throughout the 2024 season. Maybe runs because we know the Williams Swatch is going to be behind the wheel for at least nine races this year. And I would be, wouldn't be surprised if we see John Hunter Nemechek, Bubba Wallace perhaps, or maybe someone out of left field get a chance and opportunity to work with Tricon Garage this year. It's an exciting opportunity for her, though. And again, I really hope that Tony Bridinger does make 
percent the best out of it because I think she does have the talent and capabilities to be competitive, but she's not the best driver in the world. She's gotten better. I will say that she has shown a lot of improvement in the last year or so, getting her first career top five in ARCA. I really hope that she gets a chance and opportunity to show what she's capable of with this organization and team in the one race here, and I wonder how many races exactly she'll get. We'll have to wait and see what happens on exactly how many races that she'll get the chance and opportunity to work with them in 2024. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Roger Karoop. Now, I've been following Roger Karoop over the course of the last few weeks. You have seen that Roger Karoop has continued to tease his 2024 plans. Now, Roger revealed about a month or two ago that he does have a ride lined up for 2024, but has not been able to announce it at this point. And he continues to tease on Twitter that he says an announcement is coming really, really soon. Now, where is Roger Kroof likely going in 2024? Well, there's two organizations he's likely headed to. The first one could be Spire Motorsports. He has been linked to Spire Motorsports a lot during this offseason, and a lot of people are linking him to the number seven truck for 2024. Obviously, Roger has driven for Spire Motorsports in the truck series in the past, made his first career start with them at Gateway or Worldwide Technology Raceway, and also made a couple other starts and honestly was not that bad. And remember, KBM stuff got purchased by Spire Motorsports. The other team is Rev Racing. Roger drove for Rev Racing in ARCA and nearly won a couple races and was very competitive in a lot of events, especially in the second year he ran full time. I think he could be a second teammate, maybe drive the number six truck perhaps with Rev Racing. As we already know that Nick Sanchez is going to be with Rev Racing this year. Maybe Roger goes to the number six car truck, excuse me, for Rev Racing this season. Nonetheless, so I think it is going to either be Spire Motorsports or Rev Racing is going to be the organization and team that he ends up driving for in 2024. I think Roger has shown a lot of improvement last year, and I think if Roger does truly go to Spire or this team, I think he'll be very, very competitive and really, really strong in the 2024 season. I'm excited to see what he can do with whatever organization he ends up going to, and hopefully we'll hear an announcement in regards to Roger Cruz 2024 plans here not too far down the road. I'm excited to see what he'll be doing in 2024. He's a talented enough driver. He's gifted, and I think he'll show a lot of improvement in 2024. And honestly, wherever he goes, I think he could get his first career win. It's a bigger step up, and I think he will definitely 100% be able to step up in the 2024 season. I'm excited to see what he'll get to do and the chance and opportunity to work with an organization once again in 2024. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Kyle Busch. Now, if you were on social media last night, you probably saw Kyle Busch put out a little bit of a teaser and maybe put out like a major scream emoji, among other things. And this could be Kyle Busch teasing an announcement for 2024. Now, what could this announcement be? Well, a couple things potentially could be. One, it could be him indicating that he's probably not too far away from announcing his 2024 Truck Series plans. Kyle Busch, around this time last year, announced the race that he was going to be running in 2023. So I imagine not too far down the road, he's going to announce his Truck Series plans because he's expected to run five Truck Series races with Spire Motorsports because he's going to be working with Spire Motorsports in the Truck Series here, kind of counseling that team and trying to grow that organization because, remember, Spire Motorsports is going in to the Kyle Busch Motorsports building in 2018. And 24, and also probably will be working with Saint Smith and Carson Ospar and other drivers who end up going to that team. The other one could be his Xfinity Series plans. Kyle Busch ran around four or five Xfinity Series races last year with Collard Racing. We already know the number 10 car for Collard Racing is coming back in 2024. So we know that the, we'll see with Daniel Dye for 10 races. I wonder if we end up seeing Kyle Busch go over and work with this organization, Collard Racing, once again, and try to build them up, work with Shane Van Gisbergen, and really try to build Collard Racing up. That could be a possibility. Maybe Kyle Busch, shockingly and crazy, is going to announce a new sponsor. Maybe he's going to announce he's going to retire out of nowhere. I don't think that's going to exactly happen, but that would be very interesting if he did end up announcing retirement from the sport. Again, I don't think that is going to happen at this point. Nonetheless, it's going to be interesting to see what kind of announcement Kyle Busch has. We'll probably hear about it not too far down the road, and hopefully Kyle Busch kind of announces what he's doing here in the not so distant future is this kind of interesting to see that he's teasing an announcement here it'd be exciting to see what he decides to do for 2024 
And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Daniel Suarez. Now, Daniel Suarez was interviewed by Bob Pockers during the media days, and he was asked by Bob Pockers about what is going on for 2025 and if he feels any pressure for this year, considering that Trackhouse Racing had signed Zane Smith and Connor Zalich and also Shane Van Gisberg and very recently. Now, Daniel Suarez does technically have a contract right now through the 2025 season, but contracts can easily be broken. I think Dale Suarez, in my personal opinion, is on the hot seat going into this year more than any other driver in the field, and here's why. I already mentioned a second ago. Remember, Trackhouse Racing, like I mentioned, signed Zane Smith and Shane Van Gisbergen. Zane Smith is someone I'm really high on, and I know that they're trying to incorporate having three full-time cars next year. But Zane Smith, if he does really, really good and Dale Suarez struggles, I can see Zane Smith taking over. And then you've got Shane Van Gisbergen, who's going to run seven NASCAR Cup Series races with Colin Racing this year. And also, you've got, of course, him running full-time in Xfinity. If Shane Van Gisbergen impresses and gets a ton of wins this year, I honestly do believe that SVG could take over that number 99 seat, which I don't think Trackhouse wants to do. Because here's the issue for Trackhouse. Like I mentioned, they've got four drivers that are under contract that are fighting for two or three seats. And if Dale Suarez does not have a good year this year and kind of struggles like he did last season, I'm really worried that Dale Suarez could end up losing his seat because he's been with Trackhouse Racing for three years. And let's be honest, Ross Chastain has been with that team for only two years and has already outperformed Dale Suarez in a big way. Daniel Suarez has one win and has made the playoffs only once in his career. Ross Chastain has made it both of the years and has gotten to combine four wins in the last two seasons. So if Daniel Suarez does not have a good enough season, he may lose his ride with Trackhouse Racing. Now, he could still end up being with Trackhouse, and I think there's a really good chance of possibility that he does end up signing an extension with Trackhouse Racing, but he needs to have a good enough year to keep that seat. We'll see what happens in regards to that and see if Daniel Suarez does, in fact, stay with Trackhouse Racing long term. But he's definitely on the hot seat going into the 2024 season. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Lewis Hamilton. Now, we talked about this on the channel yesterday, but it was announced that Lewis Hamilton will be joining Ferrari in 2025 and will be leaving Mercedes AMG at the end of 2024. This is absolutely huge for many reasons. One, Lewis Hamilton has been with Mercedes for the last few years, really for the last 10 years as a matter of fact. And this is definitely the biggest silly season move for Formula 1 in a very long time. Since either Sebastian Vettel announced he was leaving Red Bull to go to Ferrari, when he announced that in 2014 they'd be leaving to go to Ferrari, in 2015, or when it was announced that Lewis Hamilton was going to be leaving McLaren at the end of, I think, 2012, and then leaving to go over work at Mercedes starting in 2013 and 2014, which obviously Lewis Hamilton has is arguably the most successful driver in the history of Formula One. Now, Lewis Hamilton did have a contract through 2025 with Mercedes, but look, I think Lewis Hamilton knows that Ferrari has not been the strongest organization in recent seasons and in recent years. So I think the reason he's leaving that organization is so that he can go to a team that actually is a lot more competitive. Now, what does this mean for Carlos Sainz? Carlos Sainz is, is going to be leaving Ferrari at the, end of this, at the end of this upcoming season and will likely go to a team. Now, a lot of people are speculating or expecting that he's going to go to Audi or Sauber in 2025. Remember, Audi is going to be coming into the Formula 1 in the 2025 season, and they're going to be working with Sauber. So I would expect that Carlos Sainz likely ends up going there. The other question is, who takes Lewis Hamilton's seat? Well, there are a couple of potential possibilities. You've got Alex Albon. You've got uh, Kim, Kimi Antolini, I think's the name. And you also have another driver that, of course, is named Logan Sargent, who is part of Williams. I think Alex Albon will be my choice for that seat because he's a really good driver and has earned the opportunity to go back to a top-tier Formula 1 ride. But I'm not sure exactly what they're going to do about that and if they are, in fact, going to bring Logan Sargent or Alex Albon in. And then Antonelli, who is only 18 years old, could be the replacement. It's going to be interesting to see what happens, but it's also going to be fun to see that Lewis Hamilton is going to work with Ferrari in 2025. They're going to have a strong lineup, and I think John Elkin has made an amazing and great decision for the future of his organization and team. So nonetheless, I'm excited, though, to see that Lewis Hamilton will be joining Ferrari for the 2025 season. It's exciting and a really great move for his career. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Andretti and Formula One. Now, if you saw the story that came out, I believe it was on Wednesday, 
you saw a massive announcement and one of the biggest blunders in the history of Formula One. So Andretti has, Formula One has rejected Andretti's entry bid to getting into Formula One. The reason they stated, number one, they says Andretti won't bring value to Formula One. First thing I want to say is that that is a load of BS and a load of horse shit. And I'm going to explain why this is a terrible move. One, Andretti bring, would bring a lot of value to Formula One, especially since they're bringing a new manufacturer into play. They were talking about bringing a new manufacturer into Formula One. You're telling me that Andretti, who was going to bring a new manufacturer, was not going to bring value? Are you kidding me, Formula One? That's a load of horse crap. Second one, Andretti won't be competitive. How do you know that Andretti won't be competitive? They haven't even been on the racetrack. They haven't done any testing. And if we're talking about competitiveness in Formula One, there's only one team that's really competitive right now, considering that Red Bull won 95.4% of the races, and only one race is won by a non-Red Bull driver, and two, only two of those races were not won by Max or Sappen. You're telling me that Andretti won't be competitive. You can't make that judgment call. How can you make a judgment call like Andretti won't be competitive? And then they talk about compulsory power unit supply, which that makes absolutely no sense to me, considering basically being a customer team, quintessentially, which... Only four teams are not customer teams. That being, of course, Renault, basically Alpine. You've got Mercedes. You've got Red Bull. And you also, of course, have Ferrari. You've got four teams that are not customer teams. So you'd have to take out six of the Formula 1 teams. Granted, there's going to be a couple of new ones coming in with four coming to play and Red Bull making their own chassis. I And, of course, they talk about value. The Andretti name doesn't bring value. That's a load of bullshit, if you ask me. Mario Andretti is a former Formula 1 champion. He won the championship of Formula One in 1978. Also, the Andretti name has won the Indy 500 multiple times, whether it's a driver or owner. You, of course, do have the fact that Andretti's won the Daytona 500 and has won a lot of major events. And Mario Andretti's won more races than a majority of the organizations in Formula One combined. You're telling me the Andretti name does not bring value. Yeah, I'm calling bullshit on that because personally, in my opinion, the Andretti name would bring so much value to Formula One and a lot of American fans are pissed off right now and I think it's justifiable and justified because personally, I think it's a little bullshit and I think it's freaking stupid that Andretti is not getting allowed to be in Formula One. I don't understand this. They bring a lot. Now, am I so shocked? 100%? 100%? No, I'm not 1,000% shocked, but personally, Andretti would bring a lot of value to Formula 1, and I just don't understand what they don't see in Andretti, where they basically telling them that they don't bring value. Yeah, that's a lot of BS. They were going to play the, they were going to pay the $200 million dilution fee to all the teams and said, okay, and they were going to be bringing their own engine in in 2028. Now, they could bring, they said they could approve them if they do bring a new engine in and they kind of say that they're bringing one in, which of course they were going to bring one in with Cadillac and Renault was going to supply the engines. I just think this is a load of bullshit from the Formula One and Andretti lost a lot of respect from fans and honestly, they lost all my respect from me because Andretti personally should be in Formula One and they bring a lot more value than some of these organizations Formula One. So I think it's a BS decision and a terrible call by Formula One to not allow Andretti into Formula One. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Stuart Haas Racing and their future past 2024. Now, Stuart Haas Racing, there's been a lot of questions surrounding their organization past the 2024 season for many different reasons. Jim Utter was on PRN a couple days ago. It was also, I believe, Dustin Albina from Jayski was also on the same PRN episode as well. And they talked about the future of Stuart Haas Racing. Now, obviously, coming at the end of this year, Stuart Haas Racing's contract with Ford is going to be coming to a close. Now, currently, with the current contract they have with Ford, they have to have four cars mandatory for the organization. Otherwise, they could lose their rights over there. Now, obviously, the other big talk point is the ownership. There's been a lot of talk behind the scenes that Tony Stewart has lost a lot of invested interest in Stuart Haas Racing and my sell-off is stake with Stuart Haas Racing, which I don't think that's entirely true. Now, we have seen that Tony Stewart's been a little more involved with SHR. We've already seen the videos that have surfaced and Tony's been trying to be a little more involved with SHR, which I think Tony will be, end up being a lot more involved with the team now considering that he, of course, sold off the SRX or the SRX is gone and sold off the high limit, basically sold off his series the All-Star Circuit of Champions to the High Limit Racing Series. And a lot of drivers from the All-Star Circuit of Champions, of course, are going to be going to High Limit Racing this year. As for the future of Stuart Haas Racing, and will they stay with Ford? Honestly, I don't know. I don't know if they're going to stay with Ford past 2024, but I would have had to imagine that they would have had to announce a manufacturer change 
by this point if they were going to switch. So I think there's a chance they do end up staying with Ford past 2024 and signing a multi-year contract. Now, could Stuart Haas Racing sell their charters? That's definitely been a question that's been coming in the last few months. I remember talking about this on the channel a few months ago, but there's been a, was some talk back a few months ago that Stuart Haas Racing was going to sell one of their charters to an organization like 2311 Racing had they switched to Ford. Because remember, there was a lot of talk that 2311 Racing was going to switch to Ford a few months ago, but that unfortunately did not end up happening. And they stayed with Toyota and because Sandy Hamill signed a multi-year extension. As for the long-term future, SHR, I know there's been a lot of talk about Junior Motorsports going cup racing, but obviously that hasn't happened at this point, considering the fact that they've been completely invested in other stuff. And of course, Dale Jr. has kind of talked about this, that he really doesn't want to go cup series racing with how much the charters are. I think he's waiting for the dust settle with the charter agreement, which we'll talk about here in just a second. But overall, I think the future of Stuart Haas Racing is definitely a little uncertain. And what's going to happen with that team, they've lost a lot of their drivers, they've lost a lot of their sponsors, and overall, I think there's a lot of uncertainty with the team. I know they're bringing Noah Grayson in. I know they're bringing, of course, other drivers into the team like Josh Berry. But in general, when I look at this move overall, I think there definitely is a little uncertainty for sure when it comes to sewer Haas Racing. So we'll see what happens in regards to the future of SHR and see how things end up going for sewer Haas Racing overall. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Riley Hurts. Now, it was announced this morning that Riley Hurts will drive the 15 car for Rick Ware Racing in the Daytona 500 and other select races throughout the 2024 season. It was also confirmed by Bob Pockers that Monster Energy is going to sponsor him in 2024 as well. This has been expected. There's been a lot of rumors on who is going to be driving the 15 car. Because remember, Kaz Grawl, while yes, he's going to be driving a ton of races with Rick Ware Racing this year, we knew that Kaz Grawl was going to be joining Front Row Motorsports for a select number of races. So we were kind of wondering who was going to be getting behind the wheel of the number 15 car for Rico Racing in the 500. Well, they are bringing in Riley Hurts. And honestly, this is a very good move for Riley Hurts to get this chance and opportunity. I think Riley Hurts has shown a ton of improvement in the last couple of seasons. And I think he's overall a very good driver nowadays. He's not like a top tier driver, but we saw a lot of improvement last year, especially when he got the select cup series starts. He showed a lot of major and massive improvement on the racetrack. And he got his first career win in the Xfinity series last season and ended up showing a lot of improvement. And then near the end of the year, he nearly won the last four or five races combined and got four or five consecutive top five finishes and really was very consistent. I think that Riley Herbst will do a very good job, and I think he'll show a lot of improvement, honestly, because we remember last year he competed in the 500 with this organization and was able to go out there and basically get in the top 10, which he basically got a top 10 in his debut in the Cup, which is extremely impressive, especially in the Daytona 500, getting a top 10. Now, what are my expectations of Riley? Well, I think he'll have an outside chance of winning because we know that Rooker Racing is getting a massive investment from RFK Racing, and I think that Riley Herbst has a really good chance and opportunity to compete for the overall win and compete for the overall victory. So I expect Riley Herbst to be very, very competitive. And again, the question will be how many, who else will be behind the wheel of this Rick Ware car. We know that Kaz Grawl will be in that seat for 25 races this year, including the clash this weekend. We're also expecting that Cody Ware more than likely behind the wheel of the number 15 car for 10 races this year. So I expect that Riley Herbst in the other races that have not been announced yet at this point, he'll be behind the wheel of that car, including in the Daytona 500. Getting someone higher up on the Ford Development Program. I would have thought maybe Haley Dean get a chance, but she's not getting a chance currently at the moment to drive for Rick Ware but in general I think this is a very solid and good move for him and nonetheless we'll see how Riley Hurst can end up doing with Rick Ware racing in the 2024 season in the select races again this could be an opportunity for him to go full-time with the team in the not so distant future we'll see how Riley Hurst ends up doing with this team in 2024. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the charter agreement now according to Adam Stern Cup teams have unanimously agreed to let their charter negotiation period with NASCAR expire without a further extension per sources, revealing their frustration with the state of talks. It was also purported by Adam Stern a little bit later in the evening that NASCAR could seize charters if no deals reached by the end of the year going into 2025. This is absolutely huge and honestly a massive and major red flag in many, many ways. The teams feel like that they're not getting any progress with the charter system. So here's a situation when it comes to the charter negotiations and why they have come to a close. The teams in NASCAR were hoping to have a deal done by the end of last month in January. 
However, NASCAR, what is going on is that there's two sides of the situation. One, they can't come to terms of how much money is coming out. We've had two finance investment numbers that have come out. Originally, the team's got around 39% of the money, which we all thought was 25, but according to NASCAR, it's 39%. And that number, they were only going to go up to 42%. Then he had another number indicating they wanted to go from 39 to about 49 to 50%. So they can't come to terms on how much money they're exactly expected and really want to get at this particular point. There's two other big points. One, the teams want to make the charter system permanent. NASCAR, while yes, they don't want to exactly make the charter system permanent, they don't want to make it exactly permanent because they're not against keeping the charter system. But basically, they don't want to make the charter system exactly permanent because of how the economy is. The teams also want to increase the number of the pie and the revenue because we all thought it was around 60% for the tracks, 25% for the teams, and then, of course, about 10% going to NASCAR. Now, remember, with the new TV deal going through, the teams were wanting a major increase on that pie. They're still all expected to get at least a little more money because, remember, the TV deal is $1.1 billion dollars per every single year, which is going to be up around $840 million. So that's about a 40 to 42% increase from the previous year. Now, obviously, I think it's a very complacent thing and a very complicated situation. There's been a lot of talks and demonstrations that could end up taking place. And I personally hope, and I'm with a lot of fans on this, I really hope that these teams can make a decision. Now, do I think that the sport is going to be in trouble right now? No, because technically they don't have to have the deal done until the end of the year. But the teams and drivers are one have to have a deal done at least a little bit sooner. The big reason being is because they wanted to get, bring a little more money into the table. And like I said, the teams want a lot more of that piece of that pie. NASCAR, again, is kind of having a hard time budget because the teams want about half the money, which I think that is a very fair assessment. Even though it's going to be going up tens to 20 millions of dollars if they increase at least one or two percent. I still believe that there should be more money coming in for the teams, especially with how unsustainable the economy is at the moment right now. And these teams have spent a lot of money on charters. And NASCAR has suggested a budget cap, which Formula One, they currently have a budget cap as well. In general, when I think of the charter agreement and getting it approved, it's going to be really tough because, again, there's been a lot of talks and demonstrations potentially coming into play, and there could be a lot of issues going down the road when it comes to the charter agreement and everything going through. Because Denny Hamill said on his podcast this past week that they feel like the charter negotiations had not gotten any better in the last 12 months. And there's a lot of talk, like I said, of demonstrations taking place. But I will say this. I don't think that, or do I think the teams are going to go off and make their own series? I don't think they're going to because I think the teams need NASCAR and NASCAR needs the teams. Look at the SRX, for example. They only lasted for three seasons and they were not getting the viewership of NASCAR. And NASCAR owns a majority of these tracks. Yes, the Cars Tour has grown. A lot of these teams could go to the Cars Tour and grow. But the Cars Tour, yes, it's growing, is not as big as NASCAR. So I'm very think, and obviously there's a lot of talk maybe in the future, the Cars Tour could get bought by NASCAR. So it's going to be very interesting to see how things play out when it comes to the charter agreement and how things end up working through. But in general, I really hope they are able to figure out this charter agreement situation as I think for the health and the sake of the sport's future, they need to figure out what is going on, especially with the current charter agreement and the charter situation, in my honest and sincere opinion. And now we're going to head on to the first of two major stories in today's episode as we're talking about Shane Van Gisbergen. As Shane Van Gisbergen's 2024 NASCAR Cup Series schedule has been officially finalized, and he'll be driving the number 16 car for Colling Racing in 2024. The six, seven races he's going to run will be Circuit Americas on March the 16th, followed by Talladega on April 21st. After that, a race at Charlotte May 26th for the Coca-Cola 600, and we'll race at Chicago for the Chicago Street Course race on July the 7th. After that, a race at Watkins Glen on September 15th, then a race at Talladega on October 6th, and then his final race is going to be <coughs> at Las Vegas Motor Speedway on October 20th. So he's going to have a mixture of road courses and super speedways and also major ovals as well. have one mile and a half, actually two mile and a half races with Charlotte and Las Vegas. He'll have two super speedway races with Talladega, both of those races, and then of course have three road course races on his schedule. This is absolutely huge because we know that A.J. Allmendinger was expected to run some select cup series races this year. I wonder if Cog is going to run a third car at some point for A.J. Allmendinger, maybe the 13 car because there's been a lot of talk that the 13 car could come into play. And obviously this move of him going over to the 16 car makes a lot of sense. We weren't sure if it was going to be of Colleg racing in the cup series 
Orville was going to be track us racing and the Project 91 car, which we'll get to talk about here in just a second <laughs> about a future of that potential Project 91 car. But going back to Shane Van Gisbergen, like I said, we already knew that Shane Van Gisbergen was going to be running seven NASCAR Cup Series races in the 2024 season. The big question is going to be, though, how is he going to do with college racing? Now, obviously having him in that number 16 car, it makes a lot of sense. And he'll get to work with AJ Allmendinger and get to work with Chris Rice and that team. We obviously know he'll be running full-time with Colleg and Xfinity. So it makes a lot of sense. Now, what are my expectations for Shane Van Gisbergen in that number 16 car? Realistically, I think he'll be very competitive, especially on the road courses this season. He's a really good road course racer. We saw he did at the Chicago Street Course. And honestly, he's probably one of my early predictions to win a race. In fact, I've already predicted that he's going to win a race this year in the NASCAR Cup Series, most likely at the Chicago Street Course. But honestly, with how good college racing is at Super Speedway tracks, especially in the Xfinity Series, I think that Shane Van Gisbergen has a really great chance and opportunity to compete for the overall win and victory with this organization, a lot of different tracks. And then going back to Xfinity Series, because he's going to run full-time in the Xfinity Series this season, I think SVG is going to have a really great chance and opportunity to go out there and win. And I would not be surprised or shocked if you see Trackhouse get involved in a bigger way, because we already know the Trackhouse and Colin are working together heavily this season. I would expect that Shane Van Gisbergen is probably going to be working in a big way with Trackhouse and helping them out this year. And Trackhouse probably helping out the College Racing Group in a pretty big way. Now, let's go and transition over to Project 91 because we don't know at this point if Project 91 is coming back. But I would imagine that there's a chance now with SVG confirming he'll be racing with Colic in the NASCAR Cup Series. I would have to imagine at this point that we are going to end up seeing the Project 91 car show up in 2024. My best guess currently at the moment is more than likely it is going to end up being probably a couple drivers. Maybe they get Lewis Hamilton out of nowhere at this point. Maybe they get some drivers like a Juan Montoya. Maybe they get Helio Castroneves. I know Helio has been promised a ride in the Daytona 500. I don't think Trackhouse is bringing the 91 car to the 500. Maybe they get Helio Castroneves. Maybe they get Carl Edwards. That'd be cool to see Carl Edwards come out of retirement and drive the 91 car because Siri Carl's been involved with some of the sponsorship with that team. Maybe we see Carl Edwards get out of retirement. But transitioning back to Shane Van Gisbergen, I'm very excited to see that SVG will be racing in the Cup Series with Colleg Racing this year. I think he's going to make the best of it, and I'm excited to see that he gets a chance and an opportunity to work with Colleg Racing in the 2024 NASCAR Cup Series season. Like I said, I think he's going to make the best of it, and I'm excited to see him get the chance and an opportunity to work <coughs> with the Colleg Racing organization in the 2024 NASCAR Cup Series season. I think he will get one win with Colleg Racing and Cup in 2024. And now we're going to hedge up on to the final major story of today's episode as we're talking about Matt Benedetto once again. As we'll get to talking about the stuff that Chris Rice said in just a second. If you've been following the sponsorship story with Matt Benedetto over the course of the last couple of weeks, you've seen the drama surrounding around Matt Benedetto. On December 27th, Matt Benedetto put out a pen emoji indicating that he had signed something for 2024. Originally, a lot of us thought he was going to be headed to AM Racing for 2024, but Bob Pockers denied those rumors. Then it was indicated that maybe he was going to be headed to Colleg Racing in 2024, and then unfortunately, Matt Benedetto about a week or two ago confirmed that they had to drop a sponsorship deal. He never exactly revealed the sponsor, but he said they had to drop the sponsor deal. And then about a little over a week ago, Matt Benedetto confirmed that the sponsor that he had been working with had lied to him about the sponsor and the money paying. And we were all wondering what exactly team he was going to be headed to in 2024. Well, according to Chris Rice, who spoke on Sirius M NASCAR Radio, Matt Benedetto, it sounds like, was headed there. Chris Rice says that Matt Benedetto was, according to NDA agreement, he kind of confirms, though, that a driver that's been extremely active on social media as of recently basically kind of confirmed that he was likely headed there, but unfortunately, sponsor situation sadly fell through. Now, Chris Rice does confirm and continue by saying, that Matt Benedetto is, they're trying to work together to find a way for Matt Benedetto to get a chance and opportunity. It's no coincidence if you saw recently that it was announced that Josh Williams is going to run a select number of races in the number 16 car of this year. And Shane Van Gisberg, and of course we talked about a second ago, will be of college racing for seven Cup Series races this season. I would expect that more than likely that Matt Benedetto's number of races that he had with that team currently was taken by Josh Williams and potentially Shane Van Gisberg as well. But it's really good to see that once Matt Benedetto is still in contact with College Racing about a potential ride with that team and organization, 
But two, I think that Matt Benedetto would be a solid candidate to go to college racing and would have been a great driver to go there. Look, Matt Benedetto, in my opinion, well, he's not the greatest talent in the world. He's not like a Kyle Larson or Kyle Busch level talent, but he's on the same level as Bubba Wallace when it comes to the talent level. I think he is overall a solid race car driver. He's a good driver who can get the best out of equipment. Remember, a few years ago, Matt Benedetto was able to go out there and make the playoffs with the Wood Brothers, and then he won with Rackley two years ago. Granted, it was a controversial finish, and also made the playoffs of Rackley in 2023. It's not like Matt Benedetto is a bad race car driver. He's a very solid and good race car driver. But to me, I think it would have been really cool to see him go to college racing and get a Cup Series opportunity, which I had known this for a couple weeks that likely he was headed to college racing in the Cup Series. But unfortunately, with the sponsor deal falling through, he didn't get the chance and opportunity. Now, going off on social media and saying that the sponsor lied, probably not the greatest look for you. And I think if he does get the chance to work with college racing this season and gets to run with them, he needs to hire a PR person. This has been the biggest struggle for Matt Benedetto is he's not really good when it comes to public relations and laying things out. And again, I get it that he wants to be completely honest and sincere, but he's had a lot of issues with PR. We go back a few years ago with the Wood Brothers back in 2021 with the saying, let's go Brandon. He got almost kicked out of that ride because of that in 2021. And then he went on and before that, kind of called out Roger Penske. And then Roger called him out back basically on Sirius and NASCAR radio. And a lot of people were not happy with him. And then we had the Rackley situation where he announced he was leaving early and they kicked him out a few races early, which I think was not a great decision by Rackley to kick him out a few races early. But if he does get the chance and opportunity to work with Call of Racing in the not so distance future, I believe that Matt Benedetto would do a good job with that team. Now, do I think he'll race with that team this year? Possibly. I think especially with the fact that Chris and Matt are still in contact together, there would be a great opportunity for Matt, and I think he would do a pretty good job. Now, I think, do I think Matt would set the world on fire and compete for wins? No, probably not. I don't think he would go out there and compete for wins in the Cup Series, but certainly I think Matt Benedetto would do a pretty good job with the college racing if he got the chance and opportunity to work with that team and organization. We'll have to wait and see what happens in regards to what happens with Matt Benedetto, and if he does, in fact, get a chance to work with the college racing group in 2024. I hope he does get a chance. I want to see what he can do with Collig and Cup Series equipment once again. And I think he would do a pretty good job with that team. So we'll see how things work out. Again, it all comes down to sponsorship. And I think Collig Racing is looking for a lot of sponsors and funding for him to get the chance and opportunity. So we'll see what happens. Hopefully Matt Benedetto gets to work with Collig Racing in the not-so-distance future. Because I think he brought a lot, bring a lot to the table with that organization and team. And he would be a really good driver to work with being on the same team as Josh Williams being working with some of the drivers in Xfinity as well, like Shane Van Gisbergen, of course. It'd be really cool to see him have a chance and an opportunity to work with Collard Racing. Hopefully, maybe in the future, he gets to work with that team not too far down the road. So, that is good review today's NASCAR news and motorsports news video. I want to thank guys for watching. Please subscribe to the channel. Turn notifications on so if I win a video, that's go live on my channel. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and support my patron as well. Let's go to more of that and comment below your thoughts below on today's episode. Do you think Matt Benedetto was headed to Call of Racing? Let your thoughts in the comments below. And what are your thoughts about Shane Van Gisbergen running with Call of Racing and Cup? Let me your thoughts in the comments below. I don't think there's any more videos dropping on the channel today. Tomorrow on the channel, there should be something special dropping on the channel, along with the Heat race reviews. And then Sunday, we'll likely have the Cup Series race review from The Clash, if the weather can hold off. So anyways, like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's episode, and I'll see you guys next time for more great, awesome NASCAR content and other motorsports content on the channel like this. Take care, everybody.